This conference will now be recorded. Hi, aloha, and welcome to Stamp Chat. My name's Heidi. Our presenter is Mr. Kurt Streepy. He's an APS member and the secretary of the First Issues Collectors Club. Mr. Streepy's topic for us today is Hawaii. Today's Stamp Chat is sponsored by the American Philatelic Research Library. If you're an APS member, you can borrow materials from the library or request scans, photocopies, or research assistance for your philatelic inquiries. To find out more about the library, visit our webpage at stamplibrary.org and explore all the services we provide to both members and non-members. So Kurt, let's get started. Thanks for joining us. All right, thank you, Heidi. Uh, glad to be back. Uh, just a, a brief minute here on, on me um, as your presenter today. Uh, as Heidi uh, mentioned, I'm an APS member and also a First Issue Collector Club member. I also uh, am a Hawaiian Philatelic Society member and a U.S. Possession Philatelic Society member uh, as they kind of relate to this topic, uh, along with some other organizations that I've been a part of. But uh, today, speaking on my own, not speaking on behalf of any of those uh, group specifically. So, all right. So the goals for today, um, you know, is to do an overview of uh, Hawaii uh, postal stamps and history. Uh, this is a very well documented uh, postal history from Hawaii. is very well documented. We could spend hours talking about this. Uh, so I, I can only give you an overview uh, of the different eras of, um, of postal history and stamp issuing. Uh, you know, maybe here in the uh, future I'll get asked back and we can dig a little deeper uh, into uh, some of these other areas. Uh, but through this review, we'll also kind of look at what happened socially and politically that caused the, the stamps to change. Uh, and then also just, like I said, a little glimpse into uh, some specialty areas that you can look at as well. Uh, but I certainly encourage you to look at <clears throat> a website called Post Office in Paradise. Uh, it's uh, uh, hawaiianstamps.com, has a, a, a vast amount of information on there, uh, and you can find um, a great deal to read there, and uh, it's, it's just a fabulous site. So uh, definitely check that out. Um, <clears throat> So kind of starting in the very beginning, and we'll, we'll work our way uh, through to the, uh, the time of U.S. territory, but uh, I want to mention, you know, Hawaii was the first, the origins of the kingdom um, date back to the 1700s. Um, first, Captain Cook um, was the first European to come across the Hawaiian Islands uh, in his travels. Uh, he found it uh, in January of 1778, um, and at that time he named it uh, the Sandwich Islands uh, after the fourth Earl of Sandwich. Um, so, so that was the, the first encounter with European, um, and that was a good encounter. But uh, Captain Cook came back about a year later in February of um, 1779 in his second trip to Hawaii, and he didn't leave Hawaii uh, that time. He, he was killed while he was there um, uh, on Hawaii. I guess his body left, but, but he didn't uh, uh, manually leave himself. So uh, that, that trip ended a little, little more uh, poorly for him. Uh, but, um, and the picture here is the Captain Cook uh, Monument uh, in, in Hawaii. Uh, it's actually easier to snorkel to it than it is to, uh, to walk to it. So that's a, a picture from snorkeling. Uh, but that is a, a small section of the island that is actually British uh, um, territory. The, uh, the island gave that uh, monument to the, to the British, and it's considered British territory. Um, and as far as the island itself, um, after that, shortly after that, in, in 1795, um, King Kamehameha the Great, or King Kamehameha the First, uh, unified most of the islands. Um, in 1795, after a number of years of uh, uh, of war between the islands, uh, he uh, unified. He was from Hawaii, the Big Island. He picked up Oahu, Maui, Mokalai, and, and Lanai, um, and unified them under his rule. Uh, it took about another 15 years for the last couple of islands to uh, voluntarily um, join him, but um, but by 1810, 
uh, the islands were unified uh, as one kingdom. Um, and then I, I promised there are pictures of stamps here. I didn't trick you into watching a, a video of my uh, vacation slides, so uh, we will get to the stamps here in a minute. Um, but th there were a number of countries that started taking interest in Hawaii. It was very strategically located. It was, you know, being in the middle of the ocean doesn't sound all that great, but the fact that it was um, between Asia and the west coast of the U.S., it, it became very important as a stopping point for, uh, for trade, for ships going back and forth. Uh, so a lot of interest from uh, England and France and Japan and, and Russia. Uh, so the U.S. decided that they really wanted to make a good uh, uh, partner here uh, and, and worked to become trading partners with Hawaii um, and um, started sending missionaries there uh, to the island uh, in the 1820s. Uh, most of those missionaries came all the way from uh, New England uh, at that time um, and um, to, to, to Hawaii. So uh, either by going all the way around um, South America and around uh, or by coming uh, to Panama and crossing Panama on land and then uh, getting a boat and going the rest of the way. So by 1840, uh, there were a sufficient number of, um, of missionaries and traders, both U.S. and some other European and other nations on the island. Uh, so there, there needed to be, they started to look for a way to send mail to America and beyond. Uh, and, and prior to 1850, this was generally accomplished by giving the letter to a ship captain and having him drop it off at the next port uh, with, with mail. Um, so, so you'll see some uh, stampless letters uh, coming from Hawaii uh, that, uh, that emerged. So, so this is an example here. Uh, many of these early images I, I've got here for you uh, are courtesy of the Hawaiian Stamps uh, web, website. So I appreciate them uh, allowing me to, to use these images uh, because if you're going to start collecting Hawaii, uh, the early covers are not the place to start. They're, they're, they're pretty limited in your options there. Uh, but uh, this is a great example here of what a uh, stampless letter would look like. It was a, a folded letter, uh, as was common at the time. Envelopes were not all that common in uh, 1816. So you just uh, wrote your letter on one side of the paper and then folded it up and, and, and into an envelope. Uh, so this cover here is actually the, the earliest known cover in private hands. Uh, it was a cover written by a, um, or a letter written by a 16-year-old uh, boy working on a fur trading ship that had come um, from Siberia to California and were now, it was now in Hawaii uh, working its way. And, and when they stopped in 1816, they, the owner of the, the ship, the Forester, uh, was going to sell the ship to Kamehameha uh, the Great. So this boy uh, sent a letter uh, with another trading ship that was coming through. So handed it over to a captain of a ship going to, um, uh, to China. Uh, from China, it went to the Cape, uh, through the Cape of Good Hope uh, to New York City and finally to New Haven and um, took about six months for that trip to go from uh, uh, across the, uh, pretty much halfway across the world there. So once it made it to New York, uh, and we see here, uh, it got plopped into the uh, Postal Service there, and you'll see up here in the top, there's a little uh, uh, 10 cents, or well, it says 10, but it was 10 cents was the uh, postage due for uh, for whoever was gonna pick this up. So it's really a pretty good, uh, pretty good deal to go halfway around the world at that time for, for 10 cents. So, um, so that'd be an example of a very early stampless cover. Um, so uh, as, as time progressed there, uh, the island decided they needed a little more organized way to do this than instead of just going down to the port and seeing if there was any boats around. So they did start putting a bag out at the Polynesian, which was a newspaper, and you could come in, you could drop your bat, your um, your letter off uh, in that bag, and then they would uh, take it down to uh, the ships uh, whenever they were headed out. Uh, so this example here uh, is one of the early ones um, in 1850 from that service uh, where uh, you'll see the postage due on this one is 42. Uh, so the uh, ship captain got two cents for carrying it to uh, San Francisco 
And then, <clears throat> then there was a 40 cent charge to go um, uh, the rest of the way to, um, to the East Coast. And, uh, and this one went, oops, uh, and this one um, went via Panama, but you can't, oh, here it is, via Panama. So in this case, they would have went to San Francisco, took a boat to Panama, uh, tra traversed over ground from one side of Panama over to the Caribbean side, and then from there, another boat up to, uh, to New York. So that leads us into uh, the first postage stamps uh, that were uh, used in Hawaii for prepaying postage. Uh, they printed them locally. Uh, the newspaper, as I mentioned, the Polynesian, uh, printed them locally. Uh, and they started out with a set of three stamps. Uh, there was a two cent stamp that, that paid the ship fee for the captain. There was a five cent stamp that paid the post office to take the letter from the post office down to the boat. And then there was, at that time, um, the postage from San Francisco to, to, to uh, from once it got to San Francisco, the postage rate was six cents. So they had a, um, a 13 cent stamp that paid the postage for both uh, the Hawaii and the U.S. part uh, of uh, what was due. So you could actually prepay a letter all the way uh, to, uh, to, to the U.S. Um, so, uh, and then later, and that was in October of 51, in, in April of 52, they did a, a, another printing of the 13 cent stamp uh, to try to reduce the confusion about it paying both the US and the uh, Hawaii rate. So when they reprinted it, you'll see that up at the top, they um, uh, changed it from just saying Hawaii postage, Hawaiian postage to saying HI and US uh, postage. Uh, to try to clarify that this was covering one stamp covering the entire um, trip. Now, as I mentioned, uh, you know, again, this is a very uh, rare stamp. I hate to keep saying rare, but um, there, there are only 166 of the missionary stamps left last time the, um, uh, the last census I'd seen, and only about 32 covers. Uh, so, and many of these items are also you know, uh, in a postal museums. Uh, I, I saw my Hawaiian missionaries at the um, Smithsonian's Postal uh, Museum a couple of years ago. So that, that's the only place I've seen one. So, uh, so definitely a, a, a rare collector's item that, that do come to sale once in a while, but uh, command quite a, quite a price. So, and with those, one of probably the most famous Hawaii cover is, is the Dawson cover. Uh, and that's a cover that has both the, the two cent and the five cent um, uh, missionary on there uh, covering the two cent covered the uh, ship captain fee. Uh, the five cent covered the uh, postal delivery from the post office down to the boat. And then they used uh, U.S. postage for the six cents of postage. Um, now, that one uh, was last auctioned in 2013 at, at 2.24 million. So. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, that, that really puts a dent in your budget if you uh, you want to add that cover. Uh, but it is the only cover with a number one on it, uh, with a Hawaii number one uh, stamp on it. Uh, all the other few remaining are, are off cover. So um, the U.S. Postal Service paid tribute to uh, the missionary stamps a few years back, back in 2002. Uh, they made a, a kind of a souvenir sheet type uh, product that uh, listed uh, some information about the Hawaii missionaries. Uh, it shows the uh, Dawson cover, as I mentioned before, and then also uh, the four stamps, the uh, Scott one through four. Yeah, and um, it's a good way to fill that spot in your album uh, for the missionaries uh, because uh, I'm going to estimate even if you had one of these stamps, you probably wouldn't uh, pluck it in your album. It would probably uh, be kept somewhere safe. So, but but definitely a pretty product. And and, and as far as I know, you know, I, I I'm not a collector of modern U.S., so I don't know how often the U.S. honors stamps from another country. But uh, I'm I'm going to guess that's pretty pretty small number of, of foreign stamps you see on on a U.S. stamp. So. 
Uh, so a nice little piece to have, kind of some collateral for your uh, Hawaii collection. All right, so that brings us up to um, the, the next set of issues called the Boston Engraved. Uh, and um, as, as the name entails, it, they were made in Boston and they were engraved. Uh, so that, that's a pretty easy way to, to remember those. Uh, but uh, they were a picture of uh, Kamehameha III. Uh, so this was the uh, second son of Kamehameha I, uh, the first the first son, uh, Kamehameha II, had uh, died. He had become king, died, um, and uh, the third son took over as the next king. Uh, he had uh, converted to Protestantism. Uh, he brought uh, foreign advisors in, and, and he was actually uh, at, at one point working to have the U.S. annex Hawaii because out of fear that the British or the French would. So. Um, he, he did uh, kind of bring a, a, a more uh, a Western look at some things uh, w with his uh, kingdom. And you'll see he kind of has a more of a, you know, he, he's got more of a English or a French military uniform on uh, here in his photo than, than what you would maybe think uh, of someone from Hawaii. So, uh, but again, on this issue, and I'll bring it up again, is, you know, are, are there any other countries that have issued stamps that have the names of two different countries that they're that they're paying postage for? You know, now in the the days of the UPU, you know, we know we can send a letter and it goes all the way to you know Armenia or wherever we, we send that letter. Uh, but um, question I'm posing, you can put something in the chat if you know. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, I, I've not run across any other uh, countries uh, spelling out how much postage goes to each country on their stamps. Uh, but the Boston engraves, you know, were kind of a step up in quality, you know, in appearance from uh, the prior stamps uh, that were issued. And this is Kamehameha the third here. Um, so uh, again, you know, postal history-wise, uh, on these covers, again, limited number of these out there. They command some decent prices, um, but uh, but uh, far more of those available than you're going to find a missionary on a cover. Uh, and really, the you know the what uh, is always nice to see too is is you'll get combination covers with U.S. postage and Hawaii postage, and that is because the Hawaiian Post Office sold both U.S. and uh, Hawaiian postage. So as we mentioned before, you, you could get the 13 cent stamp and um, send your cover you know all the way to where it's going with, with one stamp or if you preferred you could um, pay it with a combination of, of us and, and hawaii stamps to uh, uh to get to the destination up to you. Uh, you you'll also find some covers where they may have used just a hawaiian stamp like the 13 uh, but when it reached san francisco they went ahead and put a u.s stamp either somewhere else on the envelope or actually on top of the Hawaiian stamp, uh, just to kind of reiterate that the postage is covered. Uh, so, so those make for a, a very nice, very nice items when you come across those. Now, um, Hawaii uh, realized very early on uh, that there was a demand for their, their stamps. Uh, they uh, were, you know, an exotic location, you know, very few people had ever traveled there, uh, so stamp collectors uh, did like their stamps. Uh, so they uh, made a few efforts throughout the years to make sure they had uh, a good run of stamps that they could sell. So uh, back in so in 1868 and again in 1889, uh, they reprinted these Boston engraved stamps uh, for basically for collector use. Uh, they, you know, they may have still been valid for postage, but for the most part, they were collector use or for be able to sell. They sold them at the post office, but uh, were able to, uh, to to get them there. Now, um, just to complicate it more, they, they would print a reprint uh, of, of the stamps. So they would print 10, uh, you know, Scott number 10 and Scott number 11 were reprints of uh, the Boston engraves. Uh, and then after a few years of selling the reprint, 
they would overprint them with specimen or reprint and then um, you know making another collectible item so so then when you look at scott then you also see 10s um, and 11s which were reprint which were stamped with specimen uh, so it, it kind of gives them multiple multiple items there um, you know those are definitely in the, the scott specialized album i don't probably not in the regular album or re regular uh, catalog so but they were, you know, realized that early on it was a good idea to, to keep a, a, a supply of stamps on hand, and, and we'll see that some more as we go through here. Um, the next one was another group of stamps that they uh, issued locally. Again, going to, you know, a printer locally to make some stamps in a hurry, uh, because the turnaround time, you know, of producing a stamp that, you know, you, you're having printed in the East Coast of the U.S. takes a little time. So in 1859, they, they had decided to uh, start a postal uh, fee for uh, for postage for letters on the island. Up until now, uh, a local letter there was no postage charge; it was just delivered for free or, or available for free. Uh, but they added a new one now. We're going to start charging a, a one cent uh, for uh, newspapers, two cents for a local letter. Uh, so now they were kind of in need of, of some more one cent and two cent stamps. Uh, those Boston engraves were only five and 13. Uh, so, uh, so locally they printed the numerals, which, um, you know, were not the most attractive stamps. Uh, but for those that specialize in numerals, you know, there, there's that uh, beauty in the eye beholder. Uh, and, and since they were printed in these strips of, of 10, uh, they're, they're very, e well, I wouldn't say easily plated. They're, they're, you can plate them to the exact location and plate used. Uh, and that's actually how you how they're expertized. If they can't be plated into one of the known plates, then, then there will soon be forgeries. Um, so, so they made a, a number of them, one, two, and five cent ones. Um, and uh, Scott lists about 14 or so uh, different uh, catalog numbers uh, based on some variations in ink color and paper. Uh, and uh, and the, the such. So, uh, you know, the, uh, this is definitely one that that's highly um, uh, forged. So, uh, you know, personally, when I buy them, I, I don't buy them uh, without already having a certificate on them. Uh, you know, you, you can see some, you know, some of those auction places. You'll you'll find those uh, values, and and or you'll see that super rare stamp that's uh, highly priced, but uh, without a uh, certificate, I'd be a little wary. So, um, so you might keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> so the numerals, um, I, again, you can find those on covers, both within the island and on um, uh, rates to the US. Uh, and again, you'll see a lot of mixed use US, Hawaii uh, stamps that um, just, just make for a, a pretty cover. Uh, that are available. Now they did not print any stamps this time that said U.S. and um, Hawaii postage. Uh, these were all actually they're listed as inter-island uh, because they're, they're the rates on the island, but there are some covers that go out of the island uh, with those stamps. All right, so now we get a little closer to some stamps that that you might you know find in your everyday collection. Um, and things that are a little more closer to your, your starting point if, if you're going to start collecting Hawaii and you hadn't before. Um, uh, the next group of stamps that came out was the Boston lithograph. Uh, and these, um, you know, were, don't have to be a genius to, to understand the names, but these were printed in Boston and they were a lithograph. Um, so they were printed with uh, Kamehameha the Fourth, uh, which uh, is actually the great, uh, let's see, would be the uh, be a grandson of <clears throat> Kamehameha the first, but not actually the son of either Kamehameha the second or the third. Um, they didn't have heirs. So um, here we are, you know, a photo, and you know, again, much more like a, a, a European type military um, uh, uniform almost that, that's uh, used in the picture and in the stamp. Um, but this one was printed, and, and interestingly, the postmaster at the time. Uh, when he had them printed, uh, he forgot to put the word Hawaii on there. The, these actually say uh, basically two cents postage. They, they don't have the, uh, the country's name on there anywhere. 
Now the two cent stamp was was the local rate, so you know for the most part it would have been a local stamp anyway, but um, certainly could have been used uh, outside of Hawaii. Uh, so the, the the first listings were were 27 and 28 uh, in in Scott, uh, and, and that's based on uh, paper. Uh, there's a vertical or a horizontal uh, laid paper is the difference between those. Uh, and, and then Scott lists a couple of subcategory ones based on some color. Uh, changes, uh, but but those became available. And then, like the others we mentioned before, uh, there were a number number of reissues and and, and official imitations that were printed. Uh, the reissues used the original plates. Uh, the imitations they had to um, uh, create a, a plate when they they thought they had lost it, uh, and then a few years later they found the plate, so they printed some more. And and, and same situation, you can buy them without. Any kind of overprint, the 29, 50, and 51, uh, or later they slapped specimen on there uh, and sold them again as, a, as another item. So, so finally getting to a piece that's actually in my collection as far as uh, covers and stamp go. Um, so this cover here I picked up um, a few years ago, and, and it's it's addressed to uh, to Mrs. Frederick Lehman. Uh, and so while we were in Hilo a few years ago, I saw there was a layman um, uh, missionary museum. So I had to go check that out. So this is the, um, uh, the, the house here is the museum, or well, the house is a museum, uh, but it was the home of Frederick Layman's parents. And, and his parents uh, were, um, uh, were missionaries uh, on the island, and then he grew up on the island, stayed on the island. Uh, and then Isabel's parents were missionaries uh, also, and they, their their home is also a museum. Uh, it's in Honolulu, uh, Missionary House Museum. Uh, so, you know, it was a nice little interesting way to connect my uh, vacation to my stamp collecting when I, when I got to, to pay a visit there. But uh, th this kind of starts the 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 look at, at how the the missionaries changed the island not, not only did the missionaries come and convert uh the um the, the people to uh, christianity uh they they also stayed there and their their kids grew up there and, and the children of the missionaries became very powerful people throughout um as as they grew uh both politically and financially frederick for example was a judge uh, he was a delegate in the uh, Constitutional Convention with, uh, of the Republic. He was a senator for the Republic. Uh, he was the president of the telephone company, and he helped organize the electric company. So, uh, so he definitely had an impact on that. And, and we'll see there's a, a lot of sons and daughters and, and descendants of missionaries uh, that, that have an impact uh, on Hawaii's um, uh, future going forward here. So next we come to the banknote issues, and these are the ones that you know you'll start to see in your collection. You know, maybe if you just have a worldwide collection, or bought a big album, uh, or bought a uh, U.S. possession remainder album, and it had you know because you want some Canal Zone, and and there you see some Hawaii. Uh, so some of these are the ones you'll start to see, and it's certainly where the stamps start to become uh, more attractive. Uh, and really become some of the prettiest stamps of, of the time, as far as as far as I'm concerned. Um, so uh, the, the banknote issues, yeah, we use the National Banknote Company, uh, so they'll be very similar to, to the many other stamps issued by the banknote company. Uh, but uh, this series ran uh, from 1864 to 1891, uh, pictured the Hawaiian royal family uh, for the most part. Uh, that, that was it. Um, they uh, then, of course, made the transition to the American Bank Note Company um, when that um, transition occurred. Uh, so a, a very interesting article in the American Philatelist uh, from uh, December of 19 uh, was on how these uh, uh, banknote issues got started. And this was an article by Fred Gregory, uh, who's a very well-published uh, authority in Hawaii uh, postal uh, stamps in postal history. So I would encourage you checking this out. Uh, it's a great little article, uh, but but the kind of the cliff notes of it was that, that the postmaster at the time 
thought the Hawaii stamps were pretty sad. Uh, you know, they, they just didn't really pop. Uh, so he uh, told the uh, banknote company he wanted stamps with Kamehameha the fourth on it, but he he liked this Nova Scotia stamp that he had seen. So he sent this stamp uh, along with the picture of uh, Kamehameha the fourth, and they created this stamp, which you can see is they did a pretty good job of copying the, the stamp uh, uh, from um, uh, from Nova Scotia. So they you know added the two up at the top, and, and it looks like they added a little Hawaiian flower over here at the side, uh, but uh, but got, but got those coming out. And the trend at that time was to put the reigning monarch on the most commonly used stamp. So this two cent local rate uh, got Kamehameha uh, the fourth on it. Uh, and then the other issues would have other uh, members of the uh, royal family, both uh, alive and, and dead, uh, would, would show up on the stamps. Uh, the um, bottom corner down here with uh, the picture of the statue, that's the same similar statue to the one I was standing by in the, the first slide um, of Kamehameha. That, that's the only that's the only stamp of Kamehameha the Great. They, they, there was never an image of him, only of his statue. Uh, the rest, pretty much the rest, uh, made a stamp at some point in time. Uh, <clears throat> so um, here's here's one uh, that um, uh, a cover for my collection uh, again that you know again you've got that combination of both uh, Hawaii and uh, U.S. postage stamps uh, as I mentioned the the stamps of I'm sorry the postal history of Hawaii is very well documented uh, Fred Gregory wrote a three volume book uh, of a census uh, of Hawaii postal history and um, you know this this cover is in that book uh, so from that book, I can I can pull out a lot of information. I, I can, you know, I know what ship it traveled on from uh, Hawaii to uh, to uh, San Francisco when it arrived and uh, and so forth. And, and in this case, it went again San, to San Francisco and then went overland uh, via Panama uh, down here in the uh, corner on the left uh, it says via Panama uh, to make it to New Haven. Um, on the east coast now on this cover you'll see this stamp doesn't actually belong there uh, somebody cut the corner out and kept the hawaii stamp but left the uh, u.s stamps on there uh, so at some point in time before i bought this um, uh, another stamp of the era was just sat in that spot uh, so uh so that's not truly a stamp uh, that goes with this cover but uh, something similar all right. So um, the uh, as the uh, missionary families and traders became more influential within the government and demanded a little more and a little more from the government, uh, it, it eventually got to the point that uh, the um, the Americans and Europeans had taken most of the power away from the monarchy, and when um, Queen uh, Leo Lucan came to the throne in 1893, she decided she was going to take some of that power back. Uh, unfortunately, um, the Americans didn't want to give that up. Um, so, so they overthrew the queen um, and uh, put her, uh, took, took her off the throne, eventually imprisoned her in her palace, um, which you can still visit today. And they set up a quickly set up a provisional government and asked to be annexed by the U.S. Uh, so this was a group of, you know, plantation owners. Uh, sugar was the big crop uh, at this time uh, and uh, other businessmen. And they wanted to be annexed by the U.S., both for the protection, but more importantly, for uh, the ability to trade freely with the rest of the U.S. and, and not have tariffs and taxes going between. Uh, but the president at the time, uh, Grover Cleveland, said no. He said, you know, you guys illegally took her um, out of her throne and uh, they asked to have her re reinstated. Uh, so so that didn't move as quickly as they thought it would. Uh, the U you know, if you read the history and it's a great deal of history here, too much to talk about here. But the U.S. had a little bit of, of dirty hands in, in the uh, in the, the coup. 
And that's why he, he tried to reinstate the queen because he knew we, we had, uh, were a little involved, uh, but a great story to read there uh, if you're interested. So when they set the provisional government up, uh, they decided um, that, okay, well, we got all these stamps with the pictures of the monarchs that we just, um, uh, that we just overthrew. What are we gonna do with these things? Um, so they decided to overprint them with the words uh, provisional government on them. Now, uh, a lot of this, again, back to the collectors uh, of stamps was a big ploy on this is like, is to be able to sell these stamps again. Uh, so they, they overprinted them with provisional government. Uh, they advertised in newspapers around the world that they were selling these stamps and people flocked to the post office on May 20, 1893 when they were released. Uh, some of them, they only sold if you bought the whole set in sheets. So some of these, you know, so certainly focused on collectors and dealers when you're selling, uh, requiring them to buy full sheets uh, of, of stamps uh, and buy the whole run. Um, so, uh, but there were a total of four printings of the stamps uh, as they uh, pulled uh, stamps from smaller post office and replaced them with these and they would do the overprints again. There, you know, there are a number of errors, um, oddities, you know, a missing period and, in, you know, a double overprint, um, uh, missing numbers or a nick in the one, you know, again, you can, you can kind of position some of these based on, on the, uh, on the overprint. And, and that's kind of one of those little specialty areas people look for, you know, a double overprint, inverted overprint, you know, any of those kind of things. Uh, add to um, uh, the value. Now, uh, this is um, David, um, King David uh, Kalakua, uh, who was, um, he was the king right before um, uh, Queen Leluca. Uh, he was elected king uh, because the Kamehameha family had um, come to an end. They actually elected another member of the Kamehameha family and then when he uh, passed away, the next election uh, elected um, this uh, Kalua. So he was at one time the postmaster uh, of, of Honolulu. Uh, so, I, you know, again, here's your question for your chat. If you, uh, anyone else know a postmaster that became king, uh, I'm gonna say there, there's probably a, a, a limited number of possibilities there. Uh, but yes, yeah, so he was uh, king uh, after being postmaster. And again, two cent value because most commonly used stamp. Uh, so that's why they use that on, on his. <clears throat> so uh, next we go into <clears throat> the Republic. So uh, whenever Grover Cleveland said, no, uh, we're not gonna annex you. Uh, the, um, the provisional government decided they were gonna have to do something. So they decided they would form a Republic and from this republic, then they would kind of wait out until the next president comes, because they thought once Cleveland was out of, out of the office, uh, then maybe we would have a chance and we can um, uh, look at something else. So uh, the provisional government was formed. Uh, Samper B. Dole, who's on the blue 25 cent stamp here, uh, became um, the president of the republic. And then uh, Lauren Thurston, um, kind of became the foreign minister or, or you know, he, did, he, he, was, he was in the U.S. doing the lobbying, trying to get uh, annexation moved through. Uh, stamps were printed by the American Bank Note Company. Uh, this, you know, this 12 cent uh, boat stamp is one of my favorites. Uh, you know, just, just you know, th these are the only stamps that didn't really show, that Hawaii issue didn't show people. Uh, they did, again, bring back Kamehameha uh, in the red stamp. Uh, so they, they didn't completely... Uh, throw out uh, all of the uh, the history there, but um, uh, did uh, do that. So, and yes, this is the Dole family. Uh, Sanford B's cousin was James Dole, uh, who founded uh, the Hawaiian Pineapple Company uh, in 1891 and uh, had his first plantation, um, pineapple plantation uh, on Oahu up in the High Plains. Um, and you can still visit it today. Take a little uh, walk through the uh, pineapples and a uh, little hedge maze and all kinds of good stuff. So um, 
Uh, not going to go too deep into the back of the book stuff. Uh, frankly, it's kind of limited with Hawaii anyway. But uh, but since we talked about um, Lauren Thurston, I thought we would uh, show show you his stamps too. Uh, 01 through 06 uh, were issued during the Republic. They're all the same design, just different values. Uh, but they picture uh, Lauren Thurston. Uh, so so he wrote the 1887 uh, Bayonet Constitution, which um, was uh, signed by David Kalua uh, under threat of uh, force. Uh, so he signed that one, signing away a lot of um, the monarchy's power, giving it to uh, the legislature. Um, they also spent a lot of time uh, limiting voting rights. A lot of times voting rights were either limited to landowners or limited to um, Europeans, Americans, and Hawaiians. They, they didn't uh, let, a lot of times let the, the many Asian immigrants that were there working, I uh, didn't let them vote. Um, 1892, he formed the uh, Annexation Club, uh, which became the Committee of Safety, which is, is really the one that uh, worked uh, to make it a, a territory. And then the Committee of Safety also um, uh, was part of the overthrow uh, of the Queen. And then finally, he um, drafted the Constitution for the Republic of Hawaii uh, when it was declared. So, all right, so that gets us up to a time where um, Congress finally decides, hey, Hawaii's kind of important. Um, they were, we were in the Spanish-American War. Uh, we were trying to send troops, supplies, and, and uh, the military to, to the Philippines uh, for, for, that, um, uh, for that war and, and for subsequently us taking that on as a territory. So in uh, 1894, July 4th, nice time to, to pick something, uh, Congress um, voted to annex uh, the Republic of Hawaii. So in August of 1898, uh, the Hawaii flag came down and the U.S. flag went up uh, to, uh, no, to, uh, to recognize the annexation. Now, um, it actually didn't become a territory uh, until April 30th of, uh, well, technically it didn't become a territory until June 14th of 1900. So, so there really is almost two years uh, where it, it was annexed, but not actually a territory. And uh, during that window of time uh, when they were um, annexed, but not a territory, they continued to use Hawaii stamps. And actually in 1899, they reissued uh, a few of the stamps to comply with the Universal Postal Union collar scheme as far as what color your stamps had to be based on their, their, uh, their use. Uh, so, so while you have stamps issued for the kingdom, you have stamps issued for um, the provisional government, you have stamps issued for uh, the republic, and now you have stamps issued for the annexed entity. I can't really, it's not really officially a territory, but it was, it was no longer an independent uh, nation anymore. So, so, you know, looking at some of the, the those issues when you come back um, during that window of time uh, where they've not been annexed yet, or not, sorry, not officially a territory yet, uh, there's a few postal items here. So, uh, the first one up here at the top is a, um, a set of stamps postmarked on June 13th, 1900, the last day uh, that the stamps were used. So, and this is something I found that I bought a box lot of like, I don't know, there must have been 200 uh, of those, of that same stamp in that box lot because I was looking for town councils. Uh, and I found a town council from Honolulu, and it just happened to be on the last day of issue. So that's like, that was just a, quite the bonus. Uh, so that one, there's uh, always some interesting things to find. You, even now, you know, um, over 100 years later, there's there's items out there to be found. And then this cover, uh, again, I, I stumbled across this one too. I, I bought a cover knowing it was, you know, a Hawaii cover. I, I'd seen some other stuff from this Hackfield. Um, and company, which was kind of like a hardware store, um, 
But once I and I saw, well, it looks like it's fumigated, or maybe someone cut the corners off. Who knows? Uh, but I, you know, I thought that was interesting. And then as I learned more, because I bought this a long time ago, as I learned more, I thought, oh well, this is during that time period when um, it was the in between time. This is April of 1900, so that's right before they, you know, did the formal documents of, for territory. And as I looked a little closer, finally, I see, well, it's this is addressed to Sanford B. Dole. So that was sent to the president of Hawaii at the time. Although I guess at that point in time, he was probably considered a governor or something of the annexed area. I'm not sure the exact title he would have had at that time. So again, some things, odd things turn up once in a while. And, and, and you know, the, the more you educate yourself about the topic, the, the more you uh, can find uh, in these items. And uh, one other mention of, you know, as I mentioned, some kind of specialty areas, whether it's plating numerals or uh, looking for over uh, overprint errors. Uh, another very common um, specialty area within Hawaii uh, is looking at town councils. And, and this is actually one of the areas I started because I could buy these stamps so cheaply that uh, it gave me a, a great little thing to do. And while back in the day you had to have a reference book and you could find all these, you know, you bought your reference book and you could look up and see, you know, uh, that this particular cancel, um, you know, was, you know, item 29101 and it had a scarcity of R2 and R2 means there's only 31 to 76 of them known. Um, but now all this stuff is on that hawaiianstamps.com website. You can go on there, you can look up an island, look up a city, look up an island, and you can find your cancel there. Uh, and and it, it's 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 quite quite interesting. It, and it's a nice little search because you can buy a, some old remnant U.S. possession album, and and you'll find these in there. It's great. So you know a cancel might change the value of a stamp. You know it might sell for a dollar or you know, a, a nice R2 cancel for the right person may sell for $100, $150. And, and obviously if you get into R1s or rarer, then, then they're gonna go up more. So, so it's a nice kind of, of hunting uh, expedition there uh, on the town cancels. So this is an entry from the website showing you, um, again, what the full cancel would look like uh, and um, a little bit of information about when it was used, uh, what colors are used, it's just, it's just full of information. It's just, you could spend hours just trying to explain the website. Again, Post Office in Paradise, definitely check it out um, for your kids. Um, and then a few other resources to, to keep in mind. I, I mentioned the Hawaiian uh, Philatelic Society. Uh, they've got a website, uh, they're on Twitter. They have a monthly auction for their members. Um, it's primarily Hawaii related, but they have some other stuff in there too. Uh, if you're in Hawaii, they, they have live meetings each month. Uh, well, when COVID is not going on, they have live meetings. Uh, but otherwise, they have a mail-in uh, auction as well. They have a quarterly journal, and they also offer expertising on Hawaii uh, items. So they're, they're one of the, you know, uh, APS has expertising on Hawaii, Philatelic Foundation, um, and uh, HBS are all kind of your most common three, uh, although there's certainly some others. Uh, and then U.S. Possession, um, Philatelic Society, uh, website, uh, Facebook page, Quarterly Journal, uh, great articles in there, especially if you if you go beyond Hawaii and look at the other, other um, possessions, it's a great organization there. And then as I mentioned before, that HawaiianStamps.com, fabulous, got to go there. Uh, and then I am certainly open to discussions, uh, questions, I uh, love to talk about Hawaii stamps and I'm um, available uh, by email or Twitter. So please join us. So this is, we were there two years ago when the volcanoes were going off on the big island. So that's the corner picture here. That was close as they let you get, but uh, very interesting to see. All right, Heidi. Oh, that was great. Mahalo. Thank you so much, Kurt. That was a heck of an adventure that we went on. And then to, to, to wrap it up with this volcanic image, fantastic. So I know that we have a lot of Hawaiian enthusiasts on the line. I don't know whether you're going to be chatty or not. Um, 
there has been some chat, but not exactly any direct questions. Do we have any direct questions for Kurt? Comments? I see some. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> you can look in. It was a great presentation. You're being told, Kurt. Thank you. That website, how did you end up stumbling into the Hawaiian website? Yeah, I, I found that in one of those. Uh, I remember it was the AP or HBS or um, or US Possession uh, journal or, uh, journals. They had information on that. So it seems to have been a lifesaver for you. Oh, absolutely. It definitely changed, uh, changed, changed how I looked at a lot of the things. So definitely learned a lot. Wonderful. Casey, Casey Joe, be our guest. There we go. So one thing I wanted to show you that is one of my favorites um, in Hawaiian stamps is the flying goose flaw. So this is one of the more famous flaws. Um, it's on the uh, pictorial issue. And if you can see the bottom stamp right, right here, you can see a little dot in the sky. Yes. Right. That's called the flying goose flaw. And it is on positions 48 and 49 of the sheet of these stamps. Um, and that's one of the, the most famous flaws from the Hawaiian stamps. And I just think it's funny because um, it's just a little dot. It doesn't actually look like a goose, but somebody thought it looks like a goose. So they called it the flying goose flaw. Yeah, that that's a great one, and and you know that whole luck of the draw. Sometimes that that big auction lot that I bought with it had a ton of both the uh, the red and the brown. I, I actually found both a red, both a flying goose, red one and a brown one in that lot. It was just, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, that stuff's still out there. Just you just never know what you're going to find when you when you know what to look for. And I wouldn't have known what to look for a few years ago, but definitely know now. We have a question, Kurt. Isn't there more to the story of the Dawson cover? Well, there probably is. There's probably a whole uh, um, half hour talk on the Dawson cover, I bet. Um, what, which part are they referring to? The fact it almost got burnt? We'll go ahead and say that, sure. Um, and, unless I'm. But the question wasn't specific. It was just, wasn't there okay. more to the story? Okay. I, I hate to say, I, I think, I'll tell, someone may correct me, I may be wrong here, but but as I, but I think the Dawson cover is the one that almost got tossed into the furnace, or actually was in the furnace, and somebody had to pull it out uh, when they, and saved it, uh, and then later sold it. So. And, 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 our, and excuse me, but that, we are getting a yes on that from our yeah. questioner. Okay, good. So, but but you know, again, as I mentioned, you could probably spend at least a half an hour on any one of these groups that we talked about. Um, the forgeries of Hawaii, as Casey Joe uh, made a, a comment to, again, you could spend a whole uh, presentation on that. Uh, there's some very famous forgeries of the missionaries uh, that. Um, continue to go back and forth as to whether they're real or not. I mean, they're still considered forgeries, but the family that owns them uh, gets got them retested again a couple of years ago, but they, they were still considered forgeries. So uh, so that makes for uh, possibly a future talk uh, for somebody, yeah. Yes, that is, that is something that I am putting in my forgeries part two, is the uh, Grinnell missionaries. Um, I have seen them. I've looked at them myself. I think they're fake, <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, that's a it's an amazing story that has a lot of history to it. So that is in going to be in my second forgeries talk. Good. 
that'll be exciting to look forward to. Casey, Joe, I see it all over. Excellent. We, uh, Robert Cohen is reminding us that don't forget APS has a free Hawaii stamp album and he's showing us on his camera right now. That's a that's excellent. So you can go to stamps.org for that free Hawaii stamp album. Yep. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, there, there's certainly a lot of collateral even beyond once we get past the territory. You know, you, you have a number of US stamps with Hawaii themes. You have a ton of war covers that came out of Hawaii, you know, out of the Pearl Harbor uh, post office. So that's definitely a special area you'll see uh, post or once it's a territory, uh, see war covers and, and the such. And and then as Casey's Yo is showing, there's some postal station area that I just didn't have time to add to the presentation. So. And where would that have been from? Was that a, was that Dole or where, where's your where's your stationery from? That's oh, um, yeah, the, the they issued uh, postal stationery envelopes and cards um, that you could send through the mail. They were prepaid. Um, so there's a whole nother section of uh, Hawaiian just postal stationery. That's kind of cool, too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you got written. You also have revenues and railroad stamps. So, you know, you can really uh, uh, never ending little rabbit hole to get into if you keep going down, keep looking. And that's how what, and CJ has referred to this as the rabbit hole, so mm -hmm. indeed. Thank you. Do we have any other questions, friends? Did I see someone unmuting themselves, sir? Would you like to ask a question? No, I have a comment. No, I, I oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I have a comment. I was just going to. Just going to say that uh, to all, all this talk about missionaries reminded me of a Eurythmic song that came out about don't mess with the missionary man. <laughs> of all the power they had, you know. So anyway, I'll just, that was just an aside. Yes. Well, that's a stamp chat. Go ahead, friends. I've unmuted you. I, if you have a comment there, the Inkelbarger family. Yes, yeah, Ina and I um, are avid collectors of Hawaiian stamps, particularly town councils. And I can only uh, confirm everything Kurt said, both about the availability of town councils in dealers' inventories everywhere mm -hmm. and uh, the Hawaiian goose, which I find sometimes in town council collections, you know, unidentified. So I've been collecting Hawaii basically since I was a kid living on the islands, and Ina has joined me in it in the last few years. And uh, our dealer special, we are dealers, and we're specializing in Hawaii. And uh, if anyone wants to contact us about any Hawaiian issue or uh, just to brag on what you bought recently, we'd love to see that. So um, you can get a hold of us. We're listed in the National Stamp Dealers Association, APS, and we are life members of Hawaiian Philatelic Society, which we recommend to everyone. Yeah, HPS is great. <laughs> so you never know where you'll find a Hawaiian dealer hidden under what rock, right? <laughs> Here we are in Southwest Washington, Chehalis, Washington, an hour and a half north of Portland Airport, off of I-5. Okay, General. Thank you. He did a good job. He did. I can't is she talking. I don't know, I can't hear. All right. Heidi, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Kurt. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, if thank you so much. We've gone through in an hour. It went like that, and you condensed so much information so succinctly, Kurt. So mahalo. Thank you for being our guest on APS Stamp Chat, and we hope to have you back. And friends, if your curiosity has been piqued by Kurt's presentation on Hawaii and you'd like to learn more, remember that APS members can borrow materials and request philatelic research assistance from the American Philatelic Research Library. Visit stamplibrary.org to learn more about the APRL, and while you're there, you can subscribe to the Philatelic Literature Review, the library's quarterly journal, 
Your subscription to this highly acclaimed journal helps fund the library and all of the services that we provide our patrons. Contact the library directly by emailing library at stamps.org or call 814-933-3803. Thank you for joining us on Stamp Chat. Mahalo and thank you.